What's happening, friends? Welcome to Podcast Unlocked. It's the Palindramatic, episode 464 for October 6th, 2020. Ryan McCaffrey here, and as I go around the horn on uh, my screen, I've got Destin Legary in the upper left square. Bam, hey, everybody. Sorry for the camera this week. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, my friend. No one would even know if you didn't say anything. Uh, I'm in the top right, so <laughs> hi from me. Miranda Sanchez, bottom left square. Oh, welcome to my square <laughs> and my living room. You know, we've got to do a nine-person show and then just turn it into Hollywood squares. <laughs> except it's just IGN squares or video game squares or something. And in the lower right, Brandon Tyrell. Good to see you, my friend. Hello, hello. Circle gets the square. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. I'm Shadow Stevens. Who's, yeah, how is that show... You could totally have that back on the air because just I don't put know, plexiglass man. in front of everybody and I don't social think our distance. Dem- I don't think our demographic is really, <laughs> you know, hard up for more Hollywood squares. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> I'm old. Anyway, uh, yes, this is a palindrome <laughs> episode 464. We've got plenty to cover uh, this week. And I wanted to start right here with In Exile, one of Microsoft's recent studio acquisitions, the house that Brian Fargo built. Uh, He of Wasteland fame uh, and a number of wonderful RPGs over the years. And in Exile, so interestingly here, they have not one, but two role-playing games in development now. And that's after just shipping Wasteland 3, which came out, gosh, just a month and change ago. So the first one that we heard about just, what, a couple months ago uh, was an, an Unreal Engine 5 RPG. And... The info on the second one, well, Brian Fargo taking to Twitter, where where, uh, all news breaks these days. Fargo responded to a fan on Twitter over the weekend, noting that the studio is, quote, working on wonderful new RPGs. It's too bad they take so long to make. In a follow-up tweet, he uh, clarified that the second of the two RPGs that In Exile has in development is still, quote, in the infancy of pre-production. So that's about as early on in a project as you can get. So um, guys, I'm curious to get your take on this. Brandon, I'll go your way first. Uh, Yet another RPG coming out of Microsoft Game Studios. This is good stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, you you pick up these developers for what they do and what they do really well. And in Exile, along with Obsidian, um, are really, you know, two of the marquee RPG developers in the industry. So um, the the takeaway here is pre-production like you said that is very early on in the process we won't see this for a long while uh, but you know this along with obsidian's portfolio we saw you know a little bit of a vowed we know we got a halo coming or i'm sorry uh fable coming so all in all i mean as a big rpg guy myself like this is great news and i'm looking forward to the xbox actually being the premier place to play rpgs again especially western rpgs yeah, and that's the thing. You're exactly right. You're dead on. Miranda, I mean, also, in addition to the games that Brandon mentioned, probably Outer Worlds 2, because there's another team at Obsidian, uh, that the Outer Worlds team that that finished what? I guess, gosh, they finished. That game came out a year ago already. Just, yeah. just about it. Uh, we're a few weeks shy oh, of its wow, yeah. of its one-year anniversary. Wow, that how did that happen? Um, there's been then, some other things going on. <laughs> a few things. <laughs> But then, Miranda, you've got all the Bethesda stuff. And just to Brandon's point on RPGs specifically, Starfield, Elder Scrolls 6, the, and eventually Fallout 5, of course. Um, it ha- There's just no end to the RPGs in sight on Xbox. Yeah, it's really exciting. And it kind of makes me think that once you get a bunch of these out and they're all in Game Pass, you can have all of them. So you just get like a, a little blanket for it, like a cocoon in your couch. You just like set up a little fridge or something and just live there. You have so many games to live in. And that's the thing is that I really like is that you're going to get these really cool narrative experiences on the Xbox. I think it's really needed for a while. Obviously, we have Gears, which is great, and Halo. But just having those shooters offer a very different kind of focus experience where RPGs, obviously, you make them your own, right? Or you get to live in this very unique kind of world that offers usually a living element to it, right? Like there's, there's some sort of immersion that goes beyond just like taking you through a story. So I think that's going to be really fantastic for us to help. Yeah, Miranda, I think you and I are are probably two of the bigger shooter fans genre-wise mm-hmm. on the IGN staff. And I think it's fair to say that from the very beginning, of course, Halo 1 forging the, the Xbox's identity as the shooter box. I mean, 
because the, at the, especially at the time, the PlayStation Two wasn't, for the most part, wasn't really doing first-person shooters. Like Time Splitters was kind of their biggest shooter, and Halo just a very, <laughs> very different experience. Uh, I would argue much better experience than Time Splitters. Not that there's anything wrong with Time Splitters, but um, and then yeah, just over the years, shooter after shooter. But now, yeah, is, do you think Miranda that that uh, Xbox over the coming generation could end up really shifting its reputation from the shooter console to the RPG console. I mean, that would be kind of cool to see that shift happen because I think there are just so many different kinds of experiences that you'll get out of an RPG. Uh, I think Western RPGs especially vary so much in like what they offer. Um, and I would like to see them maybe, I know Microsoft has bought a lot of studios, but it'd be really cool for them to work with a Japanese developer and get some JRPGs into the mix. Um, because obviously we are seeing some of that more so go to Sony, which makes a lot of sense. They have been yeah. traditionally the home for JRPGs, but I would like to see Xbox make more of a reach for that and to try to expand uh, kind of their por portfolio for that. And it'd be kind of cool to see Xbox be the box for your RPGs and your shooters. Yeah, I mean, Final Fantasy 16, of course, going to PlayStation mm -hmm. on, a, on an exclusivity deal there. Um, now, Destin, the... Uh, there was sort of a little bit of rumor. We I didn't bring it up on the show before because there's there didn't seem to be anything substantiating to it. But you know, there's there was a little chatter that Microsoft might be also circling Sega to Miranda's point about about a, a Japanese developer. I mean, they've been tight since the original Xbox. I mean, would uh, what would you think of of that potential scenario adding persona and and the the, the fleet of sega titles to yeah, uh yeah immediately my brain jumped to persona right away yeah. and um just who who owns fantasy star that's sega yeah so fantasy star is like this coveted title and if xbox could secure that like that would bring in a a, a whole a really, really big, passionate audience. I know a lot of our staff members actually play that particular title. Shout out to and Eric Sapp. Yeah, if they could lock that up on uh, Xbox and PC, that would be a huge win for them. And, you know, Sega... Um, <laughs> Sega's been sort of trudging along doing their Olympic games and whatnot. They haven't had too many megatons uh lately well, i would love more, to see yeah, their, their western strategy games have been have been big uh all all yeah. the all their strategy stuff does really well yeah um i would love to see microsoft dump a bunch of money into them and see what they can do with some of those old ips or even the ones that are currently doing doing okay for sega i think it'd be very weird if they were to get Sega because obviously Sega is parent company to a lot of people like Atlas who just make Persona and we haven't had a Persona just a big new Persona on an Xbox so that would be bizarre I, I don't <laughs> see them wanting to lock that out of PlayStation though because that's that's where that audience is I think is mostly uh, and I think uh, I would I don't know it'd be kind of weird not to say that I would feel bad for people. I, I guess I would feel bad for people. It's like, if this is kind of the, the expectation that they're always going to have this here, then suddenly get ripped away, but then it would be on PC. So that's good too. <laughs> Probably. I mean, the original Xbox was kind of the Dreamcast 2.0. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it had Panzer Dragoon. It had Shenmue. It <laughs> had, uh, it had a number of jet set radio, had a number of things. So radio. this would only complete the circle and <laughs> fuse. <laughs> Bad, fuse yeah. the two yeah in there uh, well, forever but just to bring it back to to in exile here and their second rpg brandon i'm kind of curious do you think so we know that the first rpg that's a little further along is unreal engine 5 do you think it would make sense for this second one that's just at the earliest incubation stages to also be an unreal engine 5 project yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? You share a lot of learnings. You have the same sort of production workflow. If this is just in pre-production and they're already in development on a UE5 game, it makes sense to, to follow it up. But it would also depend on like what kind of game it is. You know, not all engines are, are right for the, the right kind of projects they're, they're working on. As, you know, we famously seen with the Battlefield and, and some of the DICE stuff, everyone being forced to use Frostbite across EA. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It's It's... It would make sense and and i imagine you know there are people whose job it is to figure out efficiency and 
in production workflow. So I, I would imagine that would be the case. But this early out, who knows what it could be? You know, is it going to be an ISO RPG? Is it going to be a similar to a CRPG that, that you know, we, we've we kind of associate with Inexile with the Wasteland series? I, right. I don't know, but it would make sense from a just a tech and, and financial perspective. And of course, the Unreal Engine is flexible too, it, mm -hmm. or it historically has been. There's no reason to think that Unreal 5 won't be. It can be. do quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, it'll be very interesting to see. But yeah, you said it, Brandon. It's the, the Xbox had by the end of this generation really is. I mean, it is if you like Western RPGs, it is the you it is the platform for you by by no there's no questioning that at all. Uh, next up this week, speaking of Bethesda, we touched on the acquisition there a minute ago, talking about uh, the RPGs that Bethesda will add to the Xbox collection. Well, next-gen collections of Bethesda's Wolfenstein, Discord, and Prey games are apparently, a little grain of salt here, but apparently heading exclusively to the Xbox series, meaning, of course, just the S and the X. Better get used to that shorthand. When we say series, <laughs> we just mean next-gen, S and X, rather than... It's too annoying to say S, series S and series X. Just series from here on out. There's your, there's your one and only warning. <laughs> but anyway, uh, collections of those titles have been listed on the ESRB ratings website, which is, you know, that's not like just some random ratings website that's, uh, you know, in, in somewhere, some corner of the world. It's, it's the big one. It's the North American market. So uh, there's some validity to it. We'll see if indeed it comes to fruition. But the Dishonored and Prey... Uh, the Arcane Collection, a rating mentions four games, which are most likely Dishonored, Dishonored 2, Dishonored Death of the Outsider, and Prey, the most recent Prey, the reboot. The Wolfenstein Alt History Collection men also mentions four games, which are most likely The New Order, The Old Blood, Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus, and the more recent Wolfenstein Youngblood co-op uh, first-person shooter. And as I touched on, Xbox Series is listed as the only platform for both of those ESRB listings, suggesting that they could indeed be exclusive to Microsoft's consoles now that the Bethesda acquisition has happened. So, um, Miranda, I think you are a fan of one or all of these games. What would you? How would you react to getting some port-ups of those coming over Yay. exclusively to Xbox? Yay! <laughs> Mostly because I love revisiting Dishonored. Dishonored is one of the first games that, maybe not some of the first, but like one of the only games that after I finished playing it and put it down, I immediately want to restart it. Like just go back to the home screen, new run. Um, I, I think th they have such a great portfolio here, obviously. Like we've, we've gushed over Bethesda and how it's really neat to have all of these under the Xbox umbrella now. Um, and having these on next gen and being like, hey, here, here are these collections for you to catch up if you somehow miss these games and to kind of get a taste of like what they're going to have to offer to, I guess, the Xbox ecosystem. Uh, so awesome. Yay. <laughs> you like Death to see them happen. And I would assume that they're going to come to Game Pass because that would yes. be weird if they didn't. That's a great point, actually. Yeah, that all these would just dump immediately into Game Pass. Perfect. Um, yeah, Destin, which are, are any of these standouts for you of, of these... Uh, eight games that appear to be on the way to the Xbox series. Hmm. I mean, the Wolfenstein series, I suppose would be like yeah. the, the, the biggest one. I think, uh, yeah, as a shooter fan, I definitely really, really like that one. And like, if you like the option of going stealth or going, you know, full combat, I definitely think, uh, dishonored is going to be your cup of tea. This is a really, really great collection. What I find really interesting is that it does seem like this does lend a little bit more credibility to that whole idea that future titles from Bethesda will be Xbox exclusive. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't even really considered that, but yeah, what? Because if they were just looking to cash in, follow you know, to start to recoup that seven and a half billion dollars, yeah, you would think they would also put these on PS Five. Mm -hmm. But yes, mm -hmm. you make a you make a very excellent point there, Brandon. Yeah. Do you think what, what are what do you peg the odds are? How are how are you feeling now that we've had a couple weeks since the acquisition? You've had time to sit with it. 
is uh, do you feel like Starfield as kind of the probably the the closest high profile example of everything in the entire Bethesda catalog, other than obviously Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop, which are already mm -hmm. promised as timed exclusives to PS5. You think, how do you feel about Starfield? Do you think it's it's going anywhere outside of Xbox on the console side? I'm not sure. I, I really, I don't know. And <clears throat> I know that sounds like kind of a cop out, but it, it's not intended to be because we've had so much information. I mean, Bethesda just said they defer, right, to Microsoft. Um, Microsoft has said it'll be a case by case basis. And looking at the strategy of it, it you could make a case for both, right? Like, why would you, why would you cap something like Starfield to just the Series X um, when it's going to be available on Game Pass day one. And in the same in the same sort of line of thinking, uh, this collection is sort of a strange play for me as well. It makes total sense, right? Like it, it actually happens a lot. You buy a company, you figure out what you can do with an ex existing catalog that's as low resource as possible that'll you know help generate revenue immediately. In that, in that line, collection series make a ton of sense, right? Like this, yeah. this will move units. People love collections. They love to own them. They're like, Hey, I love these games. I can play them all whenever I want. So I'm going to buy this collection. That makes total sense. But if it is series exclusive <clears throat> and available on game pass, you're like, what is the onus on somebody? My thought process then is like this collection would be to drive people to subscribe to game pass, which seems to be Microsoft's MO lately. So I'm not exactly sure why this collection, why this collection being exclusive to the Series X or the Series X and S, uh, is a good thing, right? Like, with a collection like this, you're selling to collectors, you're selling to nostalgia, you're selling to people who want to own these games, who maybe played one, haven't played them all, or who've never played them and are looking for a place to jump in. Um, but if they're exclusive to this, uh, this you know console ecosystem, it, it's very strange to me that they would also put it on Game Pass because you're essentially removing the need to like own that and have those. Well, um, although you just got done saying that collectors <laughs> like to own the whole collections of things. And so mm -hmm. wouldn't they want to buy the, like physically buy it either, either in digital form or even probably in, in physical form. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I don't think of physical as like the go-to anymore. I imagine digital now is the go-to, but you, that's an excellent point. Owning one case with all the games in it is, totally something that you know is still valuable to a huge subset of people so um that makes sense but it, it just seems strange that you would like bundle in value collections and then make it available for free on the right. only ecosystem that you can play it as long as you are already subscribed to game pass and well, i don't remember what the conversion numbers are right now but i think game pass has what, what were the numbers recently 15 from a few million, years ago? I 15, 15 million. million that's not that's that's not a that's not a few people so so um, so on that point, really quickly, I will say that there are definitely those people out there who don't subscribe to Game Pass just because they don't feel like they have the time to play all the games or like maybe it's yeah. a little bit overwhelming. And we've, we've had some people uh, talk to us about that in our comments as well. Uh, also, shout out to everyone who sent me the permanent games on your, living on your Xbox. I really appreciate reading those. Oh, those yeah, are really cool. It was cool to see a little, the differences between those. Um, but anyway, so I think like these sort of collections are great for those people who don't necessarily want to subscribe to Game Pass because of maybe they don't have time for it. But they were always interested, say, in Dishonored 2 or Dishonored. And they're like, mm -hmm. this is the perfect kind of pack to just get it all at once. So I think they're still trying to serve that market and just make sure that people want that. And I know there are plenty of people who do still love collecting physical editions. Like if you just look at even our team, like Janet um, on our guides team, she loves collecting physical editions of things. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of people out there who want to make sure that they can actually ha like hold their games. It's like, this, this lives with me forever. <laughs> so... That's yeah, why I'm a future Bentley. Still got my copy. That's definitely a fair <laughs> point. The collectors out there. And I guess, Brandon, the other thing I would say to your point too is uh, thinking through it as you guys have been talking, we just got done saying that, you know, this is probably a low impact project mm -hmm. for Bethesda and, you know, it probably didn't cost a lot of money for Bethesda and Microsoft to put this together. So, in that sense, even if you are kind of giving it away for free to Game Pass subscribers, you know, if it if it either drives a few yeah. new Game Pass subscriptions or just keeps just adds value and keeps people subscribed, well then it can it can pay for that project. It can pay for itself 
pretty quickly, I would imagine. Yeah, totally. And that's the thing, too, is like whatever your definition of value is, if if adding, you know, however many hundreds of hours of, of games to Game Pass is considered value for them, then then I think you're totally right as, as well. I, I'm, I was thinking about it more in the terms of like sales or mm -hmm. driving, uh, you know, converting people over to Game Pass. Right. But say say you're, you know, Joe is playing uh, Game Pass and he's like, OK, I, I've spent my 15 bucks, I have my subscription, I'm gonna play these two games and then I'm gonna unsubscribe. Uh, and then he gets started on the Dishonored series and you know, four months later he's finished right. them all. That's that's 60 bucks, right? Or just more money than that. I can't do yeah. that right now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, added value, not only in like a reason to stay in Game Pass, but also a reason to join it, I think is, is probably something that, you know, could be looked at as a win for Microsoft. Yeah. With the collection and uh and quite frankly wolfenstein and and dishonored and prey as well they deserve a little extra attention they're they're excellent games and and also excellent single player games that's you know xbox has been criticized for that a lot over the past generation so here you go here's to brent to your point brandon uh, dozens of hours between the the eight total games in this collection dozens upon dozens of hours of, uh, of great single-player content. Next up this week, Cyberpunk 2077. We are T-minus, uh, let's see, six weeks out, I believe. Uh, yeah, November 19th. That's yeah, pretty much oh. six weeks out. Uh, Miranda's having cold sweats over there for game help and the, the wiki team situation. We can do it. Can do it. I, I believe. Please, everybody out there, if you're listening right now, hear my plea. Use IGN guides, please. Please use our guides. We're going to work so hard for you. We're going to try to answer all your questions. We're going to find all the mysterious elevators. I'm going to put them on a map just for you. Please use our guides. Well, and how about, Miranda, how about help out with your guides too, right? Because there's going to be so many little Easter eggs and little corners of Night City, right? To, that people can just jump in and and add to the uh, to the wiki themselves. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you have an IGN account and you have two-factor authentication, um, enabled, you should be able to edit if you find a nice little secret in an area. So you're also welcome to just jump like right in the comments, like, oh, I found this thing and we'll go check it out for you. And of course, uh, we, I know this is hard to get a, like a little wiki tangent, but no, we do, do have it. a, um, a Twitter account that you can tag. You can also tag me and other individual guides editors. Um, so that's IGN wikis, I believe on Twitter. And you can tell us if you guys have any issues with anything, or if you have any pressing questions that you don't think our guides answering, we'll try our best to do it. Well, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 won't just be taking over Miranda's life here in, in six weeks' time. It'll probably be taking over a lot of people's lives, a lot of gamers' lives. I know that's, with Halo out uh, of the picture, that's the game I'm, I'm most looking forward to personally. And it has gone gold. That is the news item that I've been dancing around here for the past couple minutes. It has gone gold. Now, of course, I say that that is mostly a meaningless designation these days. Uh, because work does not simply stop. It's just when they've decided to, it's just which build they've decided to put on a disc to send out, to press uh, at manufacturing and send out to stores. But even if you buy that disc and get home, you're still going to have to give, uh, to update the game in order to, to play it. Uh, there's probably going to be a substantial day one patch, especially given how relatively early it's gone gold here six weeks out. There'll be another six weeks worth of work put into the game by the time uh, you actually put that disc into your Xbox, either either your uh, your series or your Xbox One, or if you're just playing on PC. But uh, yeah, it's it, maybe not a file size substantial. I'm not saying you're going to get some like Modern Warfare like 80 gigabyte patch. No idea. Maybe, maybe not. But as far as what's in that day one patch, it'll probably be substantial. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I can't help but think of our friend Paris, Paris Lilly, when I think of Cyberpunk going gold, because he has been the most excited person that I know about Cyberpunk. And it, it got me thinking, I wanted to go around the table. I'm going to start with Destin first here. Games, I feel like games don't come around super often where we're just like next level excited for them, like just it's all you can think about. You can't wait till it's out. You know, there's plenty of games we look forward to. But Destin, is there a game that comes to mind that recently 
you know, where, where, what's the most recent game that comes to mind where you are just completely amped for it? Well, I mean, a, a game that I couldn't compare what Cyberpunk is going to do for games and like what you're going to have option wise. The first game that ever had me excited like that was Mass Effect because I followed all the developer diaries when Casey Hudson was talking about how they concepted the world from scratch and everything. They have an excellent foundation for Cyberpunk 2077. They're working with Mike Pondsmith. And yeah, I know that's that's like a really, really old title that I, I'm using as an example, but man, they just really, really fleshed out that world and created the characters and they, they invented new combat systems. I think Cyberpunk is really, really going to introduce new things that hadn't been thought of before in game development that is going to push that genre of games forward in an interesting way. So I, I'm incredibly excited about Cyberpunk 2077. I absolutely get it. Uh, I actually don't even want to see any more about it. I just want to play the game at this point, you know? That's And that's probably, that might be a telltale sign of, of maximum hype, where you're like, just don't show me any more. Yeah. I don't want to ruin anything else. Just give me the game. And actually, I like what you said, too, about you brought up kind of the first game that made you feel that way with Mass Effect 1. Mm -hmm. And now now I want to go keep going. So, Brandon, I'm kind of <laughs> curious, what's, what's the most recent game that's had you at that next level hype, whether it's Cyberpunk or something else? And can you remember the first game in your life that you felt that way about? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, that's tough. I can't remember the first one. Uh, I remember, man, what a, what a spot to be in. I do remember um, I felt this way. I felt that way over, uh, strangely enough, the Kingdom Under Fire series because I was yeah. a, I was a teenager and, you know. Xbox as a big, 360, what's up? As a big fantasy nerd and big Lord of the Rings fan, I was like, it's like the Battle of Minas Tirith, but I can play it in a video game. I was so, so pumped for that to the point where I walked to games. Uh, GameStop. There we go. Uh, I walked to GameStop, which was a mile and a half away from my apartment at the time. I walked there three times because the first time they delayed it. I didn't know that because I didn't know idea about video game release dates. Yeah. Second time they were out of stock. And the third time I walked there, I finally got it, ran home and just played it for, for days. Um, so I remember just that being all encompassing. Uh, more recently, State of Decay. Uh, just following the uh, the blogs. I mean, even yes. before I worked at IGN, I was writing like two thousand word think pieces on on this game, and it, just everything that that game was sort of uh, putting out is I, I was picking up in a really strong way about like you can do anything. How would you survive? And um, I remember being very excited for that. Looking forward, it's a little bit harder uh, just because I don't, you know, we don't we don't have a ton of time to obsess about things. Uh, we we cover so many different little games um, and big games, but uh, looking forward, I think Avowed has me very interested. I'm very interested in seeing what um, the initiative is up to, um, but we don't have any concrete information about either of those games. So I think God of War 2 is something that I'm very hyped about, and, and to, to the degree I don't want to know anything else about it, I know I'm going to like it, so I'll just yeah. play it. Um, and then the other one being Dragon Age 4, I think, is is the other concrete one that we've seen little teases of. We saw some work in progress stuff. We saw some sizzle reels. I know I'm going to love that game, uh, assuming it's not like Dragon Age 2. I know I'm going to love that game. So I'm not going to I'm not going to follow along as 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 best I can, right? Because yeah, you know how it works. Job hazard. Game. If you know a lot about something, you have to cover it. So I'm going to try to weasel my way out of that one, but. There's a bunch of great stuff coming out. And the problem is it's all far enough away that I don't have to sit here and think about it while I lie in bed at night. So um, I don't know if it's a cop out, but those are kind of my answers. Uh, Miranda, how about you? A, a, a recent one and maybe if you can remember an early one or the, even the first one. I had to actually do some research because I think I remember the first one which is, is a little fun story. So I guess I'll go with the first one first. Uh, so you might've been seeing me tapping on my phone. Uh, I had to look up a date for this. So for me, hype is really difficult, especially professionally now. I, I mostly just approach things with ca cautious optimism, unless I feel like I can be excited because the studio has proven time and time again that there's something here that they just know what they're doing. And that's kind of the case for me, at least. I know I just said I was going to talk about my past one, but uh, that's why I'm also very excited about Cyberpunk. But taking it back to when I could just, I don't know, I was just having a good time. I was a kid. 
Uh, so when I was 13 years old, uh, I had some problems breathing with asthma and stuff. So there's this one thing called, uh, gosh darn it, what are they called? Nebulizers. Oh, so I have one of those upstairs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so breathing <laughs> treatments. So I remember one year during E3, uh, I, I was doing a breathing treatment. And I was like really stressed and they're like, look, video games. So I was like, yay. <laughs> Uh, and then there's doing stuff for Twilight Princess. So that's Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. And historically, for me at least, Ocarina of Time was like a foundational game for me. And so seeing like this darker version of Legend of Zelda just hype through the roof. I was so excited. I like consumed every piece of media I could about that game. I wanted to know everything about it. I wanted the Wii so bad. I was so excited for it. Uh, and I had a great time with it, even though it was kind of easy. So <laughs> that was, I think, my first instance of just being max excitement. And I think there's been a few times since then that I have felt that. Uh, but looking forward, it's really hard to say of, like, the one thing that I, I could just, like, go, f like, just full unleash excitement. And the only other one that I can think of at this moment, aside from Cyberpunk, that I'm really excited for, uh, is Breath of the Wild 2. Because <laughs> like that, I, again, coming back to Zelda, I just feel like Nintendo's really proven that they can do a lot there. Um, and so that's not one that I feel like I need to approach with cautious optimism. Also, I know I'm probably not going to review that, so I can just be excited about it and I don't have to approach it in a different mindset. So I think that also kind of affects how I, I think about games sometimes. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to be covering this? Is it just for guides? Okay, cool. That I can just, you know, I don't know, enjoy it without having to think times think too much about it. I still think a lot about the games that I'm playing. I will always criticize the ones I'm playing, even I'm streaming. But uh, the way that I can allow myself just to kind of enjoy the process of, of the lead up to the actual launch of the game is a little different, varied, um, based on like, I guess, how I'm covering the game for work. If that makes sure. sense. <laughs> well, you guys were talking, I actually thought of uh, two others I just want to mention really quick Please, that were yeah. pretty, pretty astronomical leaps. Uh, Grand Theft Auto 3, when I first started playing that, I would I just couldn't believe that this game existed. It was basically like New York, right? And you had this whole city to just do whatever you wanted in. I would stay up at night and just sit in a car in an alleyway and listen to the radio. <laughs> to, like I, you could actually pause the game, pick a radio station, yeah. and it would just play the radio. And it didn't loop. Like it, like I think they had like eventually hours it did, hour. but yeah, it uh, took... eventually, but it took <laughs> yeah. a very very long time. And I believe I listened to Laszlo's channel. Like, oh, yeah. Just just nonstop because there was like a lot of funny jokes in there. And then um, look, like it or not, they got a ton of crap at the time. But I, I still think No Man's Sky did something really, really special. Being able to have a whole planet created and while well, there's not a ton going on there, being able to leave that planet and go to another one. I don't know when we're going to see another game that does something as interesting as that. Or at least that they attempted to do. And yeah, I, I think those will push forward ideas in the industry, like GTA if, did and No Man's Sky probably will. I will say, if you want a game where you can travel between planet to planet seamlessly, <laughs> check out The Outer Wilds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just go throw that out there. No, game pass. You guys got to play it. You got to play it. Oh, I'll I'm never get rid of this. I'm seconding the the Zelda sequel as well. I, I totally forgot about that. But Miranda's right. If at worst that game is more Breath of the Wild, then yeah. cool. Yeah, Sign me up. Exactly. Well, Destin, you're not the only one that, that would just go sit in a parked car in Grand Theft Auto 3 and listen to the radio stations. I did the same thing. But for me, yeah, as far as hype, like just, again, cyberpunk kind of levels of hype, uh, like our friend Paris, uh, that, that excitement. I remembered while you guys were talking, the first time I ever felt that way, Super Mario Brothers 3. I remember mm -hmm. before, because it was, and the it was wizard. the wizard. Yes, because yeah, the yeah. it came out before the game. And I remember I was just, I could not contain myself as a kid waiting for Super it's, Mario Brothers 3. It's a movie from the 80s about a kid who, uh, and, and my memory is foggy here about this movie, but a, a kid who plays in like video game tournaments or, or goes to a video game tournament yeah. and they're playing Super Mario 3. Uh -huh. and I, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the first time that like the flute trick was publicized, right? I don't did know they, about that. Did they did they pull that out in the movie? I'm not sure. It's been that was so in the long movie, since yeah. I've seen it, but. 
No, yeah. that happens in, in the wizard. Yeah, okay. he does the the like trick where he jumps up and then warps, and that's how he wins. Yeah, right? yeah, he warps <laughs> so the back, kind of, and it blew kids' minds. Yeah. They like tease the cheat basically. Yeah, for, I in love a movie. that. Yeah, it was kind of it, it, it'd be like it'd be like if uh, Contra there was a movie about Contra and they did like the Konami code, uh, you know, <laughs> like it's down, that down, it's down. that level of like iconic. <laughs> holy crap, this changed the game because yeah. remember back then there was no internet; it was all magazines, right? You know, but yeah, Super Mario Three was the first time, and I remember I still remember I just have this vivid picture, like. We were, I usually had to save up allowance money and this and that to get, to get video games every now and again. Like my parents didn't, we just, she, they never just like bought me a game outside of a special occasion. And we're like, here you go. But I remember what my mother uh, handed me one day, uh, a, a plastic Kmart bag. Cause Kmart sold video games for a while back in the day, hand me a Kmart bag. And I could see it was a you know, white plastic bag and I could see the yellow through it because the the super mario brothers 3 if, if you can remember what the cartridge looks like just look it up if you don't but <laughs> and i took it out and it was she just got me super mario brothers 3 and it was i like th that memory still stands out but um all time for me i think that was the first but the all timer was halo 2 like i spent mm -hmm. the, the from the time of the actual unveiling uh of the that single player <laughs> level uh well even the trailer before that the where he just jumps out of the ship and the greatest in my opinion the greatest video game trailer of all time i still get goosebumps watching that like G giving what if them you their miss back? i won't yeah. <laughs> and then he just jumps out and it's the greatest thing of all time but yeah halo 2 like getting to play it at play zanzibar one flag ctf at e3 and then i i could i was all i could think about for weeks after and i went to bungie and played multiplayer at a at a, a hands-on event for like all day and ugh, yeah halo 2 and probably yeah now like cyberpunk's the closest thing where i'm like i'm pretty sure i'm just gonna lose myself in this game and it's i'm lucky i already got to play four hours of it as miranda did and so i already kind of have an idea oh now i know like okay well i want to maybe i'm gonna start on this life path and do this and do that and i'm already starting to think about how i'm gonna play that game but Quickly, but yes, punk, uh, really life life pass. Alon is in the game. She's on the nomad path. Did you guys see that? No. So yeah, no. obviously former unlock oh, hunter yeah. uh, Alana is in cyberpunk. Like she has a character in the nomad path, <laughs> which is crazy. So I just had to shout that out really quickly while we we're talking about cyberpunk. But so cool. So big congrats nice. to her. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, now, real quick, while we're on the subject of cyberpunk, I wanted to bring up uh, what is what. A, a take that went ice cold of mine very quickly after last week's show. I couldn't help but laugh. We were talking about uh, what we thought was was going to sell more in November, in the launch month of each of these games. Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War or Cyberpunk 2077. Which one was going to sell more that first month out of the gate? Because Call of Duty is a juggernaut every year, but Cyberpunk has this just this rare... It's a generational game. Yeah. yeah. It's Keanu Reeves. And, it, <laughs> and speaking of Keanu Reeves, so I said, I think I ended up saying, and uh, I think Miranda might have agreed with me, and I believe Pikachu Lita. I think we were all pretty much just giving the slight edge to Call of Duty because of their just massive marketing budget and marketing push, which I think I even specifically mentioned, oh, they always advertise on the NBA Finals every year. Mm -hmm. Well, game one of the NBA Finals this year, which from the pandemics happening later in the year than usual, what aired? This aired. Welcome to Night City. I know. What you can do is what you're willing to become. So dream big. If you can hack it, the future is yours for the take. For me? me there take. you go. <laughs> Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, that's actually the second ad that live action yeah. ad with In Keanu that's aired. Oh, here's the first one. Criminal getting caught. Oh In Night City, you can become anyone. Anything, if your body can pay the price. So seize the day, then set it on fire. 
Yeah, set it on fire. <laughs> so that, yeah, that was game one of the NBA Finals, which of course is a very highly rated television event. So there you go. Uh, I guess they've got a sizable marketing budget after all. It's not some. cheap. <laughs> Yeah, getting Keanu and and buying airtime on the NBA Finals, which is, I mean, these days probably, probably the biggest TV event, like live TV tune-in event at the moment. I mean, you've got the NFL going on Sundays, but uh, the Finals is you know it's still regular season on on the NFL. So good stuff there. And yes, uh, it's as if CD Projekt Red was listening to the show last week and just cackling, saying, "Okay, how about this." <laughs> Get Keanu on the phone now. I don't care. Put him in front of a window. Just have him walk down a hallway. Doesn't matter. Sure, he can sit in a car. That's it. That's all we need. Yeah, that's all we need. All right. So we are running out of time this week. Uh, let me actually go. Let's see. We'll skip to the loot box this week. Let's go there. Our question this week comes to us from Kyle in Wisconsin. Take it away, Kyle. Hey guys, my name is Kyle. I'm from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Huge fan of the show. Listen to you guys every week. Uh, my loot box question for you is uh, just wondering what game comes to mind for each of the Xbox generations so far uh, that gives you that wow factor like this is next gen, either graphically or uh, gameplay wise. Um, I didn't have an original Xbox. Um, I had a PS2, but for the 360, I have to say uh, Elder Scrolls Oblivion um, when you leave the sewers and um, see the open world for the first time. Uh, for Xbox One, I'd have to say Rise, Son of Rome, and then I was just wondering what will be the game for Series X for you, and for me, I think it would be um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Thanks again, guys. Oh, Kyle, great question there. That's a little bit of kind of a the similar similar thing we were talking about with, with Hype Meter, but as far as the first next thing that, that screamed next gen for you, uh, presumably mostly from a visual standpoint is, is that's sort of the first thing we all get get our jaws dropped by. Uh, so we let's quickly go around the table here. Uh, I'll actually start. I would say the original Xbox, the first splinter cell uh, because of the the lighting, the real time lighting and the they had amazing like cloth physics. like Sam could walk by a, a like a drape and and it would sort of brush away with him. Um, but then, uh, the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay was one of the most technologically amazing games on the original Xbox. Uh, but then, and then on 360, I mean, he's not wrong with his Oblivion nod there, but I would say that what came out right before that was the demo for Fight Night Round 3, which was one of the most next-gen things I had ever seen. Uh, and then on the Xbox One, I definitely can't disagree with Rise, Honestly, I, I would say literally every Forza Horizon game, two, three, and four have just blown me away uh, up until, and then Cuphead is one of the most stunning games I've ever seen. And probably Red Dead 2 is the most recent thing where I've just been like, wow, that looks incredible on the Xbox. So let me go, uh, Destin, go to you now here. You took all my answers. Like well, I wrote this up. I wrote it totally independent. I, yeah, I wrote, I wrote it before Splinter you Cell did. So, <laughs> so here, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say Fable on the original Xbox because it had the morality system. And like, if you were evil enough, like you would become all red and, and smelly and flies would follow you. But uh, it was just, it was so interesting. And I'll never forget that I was playing all good. And then my, I let my friend play on my account. And I came back after work and he had made me so evil. My character was like ruined. He was like all red and smelly and everything. But it was so, just so funny and a uh, memorable thing that could happen in a game like Fable. Uh, 360 era, I talked about it on the show a little bit. Uh, the original Mass Effect, for a lot of the reasons that I outlined, the fact that they basically built that world from scratch where like Casey Hudson was drawing the... the uh, geth on like a napkin and what he wanted them to look like. And um, Halo 3 was really special to me. It was like what got me into video production because I made a video about it, won a contest, and then sort of got set on my way into video production. And then uh, Xbox One, Red Dead Redemption 2, because for me, that was definitely a turning point where the Xbox had a system that could run a game better than PlayStation could. And Xbox it, it was One on, X, 
talking about. The Xbox One X, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so Microsoft's finally starting to figure out um, something unique with their platform in terms of uh, power and such. And as we go into the, the next-gen consoles, I think it's going to be really neck and neck with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. And that's exactly how I want it. I don't want any one person dominating. I want them pushing each other to be better. And I feel like that's what's happening going into the PS5, Xbox Series X era. And, and that's really exciting. I don't think we've seen the Xbox Series X game, as Kyle asked that is going to be like the defining one. If I had to say now, I would say the new Forza though. It's early on in development. We've only seen a few frames of it, but it looks absolutely stunning. Awesome. Well, we've got about four minutes here. Um, Miranda, oh. I'll go your way next. You're next on Sorry. the list. Okay, rapid fire, OG Xbox, Halo, because I was a small child and it was my first first person shooter and I was so excited. <laughs> Xbox 360, I played in secret. My mom was not supposed to know. <laughs> Xbox 360, uh, Gears of War, that was the first game I was jealous of. No, that was probably the second game I was jealous of someone playing. That my parents would not let me have, uh, but I eventually got anyway, oh, which is really great. Yeah, <laughs> we got there. We got there. And then also Fallout 3, uh, being able to addicted to substance in games, that, that, was, that just blew my mind. Um, I think I was still a little bit younger in my gaming experience at that point, and I was very excited to have a cool open world game. And then for Xbox One, uh, Titanfall, of course, sorry, Brandon, I actually stole this review after I saw you list it. Come like, on! That was so close. <laughs> that was so close. I ever got it so close to launch. Um, and, but my unique Xbox One ones was Fantasia Music Evolved because I really connect, and that felt like the first game. I mean, obviously, 360 had some good connect games. But that one felt like it was really using the Connect and music games in a very innovative and just fun way. Uh, yeah. So I really enjoyed that. And then another kind of wow moment for me on Xbox One was Gears 4's HDR. So whenever I went to go do um, iGen first for Gears of War 4, uh, they showed me some like comparisons of just how that could look. And I was like, dang, game's looking good now. And so that's that was really HDR cool. capable TV, right? Yes, I did not <laughs> have one at the time. So I was glad I got to see one in person. <laughs> Brandon Tyrell, the final two minutes are yours here for the, the game. <clears throat> Probably won't need them because everyone took mine. Uh, the original Xbox, I had Halo. Um, <laughs> I mean, after you leave the ship, you crash land on the ring. You walk out of the escape pod and look up and you see the ring go into the distance. For me, that was a moment where I was like, holy crap. Holy crap. <laughs> this is the future. The future is now. Um, and then to Destin's point as well, I also had Fable. Uh, and that wasn't so much graphically wise, but um, I don't I don't reference that so much as, as the graphics of the game, but as what that game allowed you to do. And the morality system was really awesome. But I also remember like your character ages and progresses over time. And when you take damage and get cut, you get scars. And I was like, this is it. This is the future. Real time, reactive character customization. Um, turns out it was kind of just a gimmick. But, you know, I, I, I still remember thinking like this is this is the start of something big. Uh, for 360, for me, it was Gears going to an area. You see that God Ray come down, and I'm just like, wow, that's a pretty video game. Uh, and then also Dead Rising, uh, less for graphics, but more because after you get through the first 15 minutes of that game's opening, and oh my God, does it take forever, you get out into the mall and you see like dozens of undead, and there are a million items for you to pick up, and all of it is there. And, and back then, it was like, it wasn't it wasn't so ubiquitous right there there weren't there weren't just things to do everywhere uh so i remember thinking like this is a giant sandbox with zombies this is exactly what i wanted and and at that point i was sold on, on uh, really on that franchise but also like the capabilities of that generation and then for the xbox one destin or uh, miranda took it sorry i almost blamed destin um that's fine but but titanfall <laughs> like i i was a huge fan of mech games mech assault was sort of my foray into xbox live that that old old OG mech game, and then Call of Duty, I was a huge fan of. So playing Titanfall is sort of a merger of those two. I felt like it was the start of a new kind of shooter. After shooters, I felt had become kind of stale. You had the the Halo school of thought and the Call of Duty school of thought, but Titanfall felt like something like a unique mix of the two. Uh, for next gen, I also agree. I don't think we've seen it yet. Um, there's nothing that's really maybe Hellblade Two. I think is is really the one that that to me is like holy crap. That is what next gen games are going to be. Um, but again, jury's still out. We'll have to wait and see. Good stuff. Uh, excellent, excellent. Yap a question there, Kyle from Wisconsin. Yeah, Send a question. Go to just Google IGN Unlocked Four Sixty Four. Leave your Yap a comment at the bottom of the page, 
and we'll uh, we'll feature you on the show next week if you leave us an awesome question. So with that, for Destin Legary, Brandon Tyrell, and Miranda Sanchez, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. This was the Palindromatic Podcast Unlocked, episode 464. We'll get to the trivia next week. Until then, happy Xbox gaming.